my name is John Voth, and welcome to Kong's Corner, the show where I seduce 9 year old people. But really, I'm reading Harry Potter every single day for an hour. Uh, we've been doing it for about six months now. I've not read the books yet. Don't spoil anything in the chat or in the comments. Do not be a joy stealer. Uh, I don't know about you, but I still dance along to the music <laughs> of that intro. I, I hear it every day. I hear it every single time, but I'm still like... So I'm still dancing along to it. Um... I, I had some neck pain today in the morning, but uh, luckily, luckily it's gotten better today, so that's good. I feel a lot better, but it, it in the morning actually had a little bit of that. Um, up here, you can see my dog, Dexter. He's having a nap. We just went on to WALK, so uh, he's, he's relaxed and he's chilling. Sometimes he'll jump up. Okay, so what happened last time? Last time, oh yeah, they made up with Hagrid. Um, who was very unhappy that they weren't taking his classes, but also because his... Oh, what? Oh, so, someone was dying. What was dying again? Oh, I completely forget, because it was a... It was some... Oh, oh, it was the giant spider he knew from, like, from his uh, first time at Hogwarts. So he was really sad about that. Um, they had Quidditch tryouts, and now they're going to Hogsmeade. Where I, you know... There's never been anything particular that's happened at Hogsmeade. I already have a premonition. I have a premonition. Aragog, that was it. I bet something horrible is going to happen at Hogsmeade. This place of peace and joy will be disrupted in the sixth book. Something, something, uh, something not quite tragic, but, uh, Something quite startling and shocking is going to happen at Hogsmeade. That is my premonition. All right, let's keep let's uh, let's start, shall we? They were just uh, exiting Hogwarts to go towards Hogsmeade. Filch was standing at the oak front doors as usual. Oh, one one second. I think it's Hannah's first time in the chat. Welcome, Hannah. Hannah Hicklin. I, I think I think maybe that that sounds a little German. I don't know. Are you German? Anyway, welcome, 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 welcome. Filch was standing at the oak front doors as usual, checking off the names of people who had permission to go into Hogsmeade. The process took even longer than normal, as Filch was triple checking everybody with his secrecy sensor. What does it matter? What does it matter if we're smuggling dark stuff out? Demanded Ron, eyeing the long, thin secrecy sensor with apprehension. Surely, you ought to be checking what we bring it back in. His cheek earned him a few extra jabs with the sensor, and he was still wincing as they stepped out into the wind and sleet. Um, the walk into Hogsmeade was not enjoyable. Harry wrapped his scarf over his lower face. The exposed part soon felt both raw and numb. The road to the village was full of students bent double against the bitter wind. More than once, Harry wondered whether they might not have had a better time in the warm common room, and when they finally reached Hogsmeade and saw that Zonko's joke shop had been boarded up, oh, that sucks, Harry took it as confirmation that his trip was not destined to be, f to be fun. Ron pointed with a thickly gloved hand towards Honeydukes, which was mercifully open, and Harry and Hermione staggered in his wake into the crowded shop. Oh, thank God, shivered Ron, as they were enveloped by warm, toffee-scented air. Let's stay here all afternoon. Um... Harry, me boy, said a booming voice from behind them. Oh, no, muttered Harry. The three of them turned to see Professor Slughorn, who was, he just pops up everywhere, who was wearing an enormous furry hat and overcoat with matching fur collar, clutching a large bag of crystallized pineapple and occupying at least a quarter of the shop. Harry, that's three of my little suppers you've missed now, said Slughorn, poking him genially in the chest. It won't do, my boy. I'm determined to have you. Miss Granger loves them, don't you? <laughs> yes, said Hermione helplessly. They're really... So, so, what? Uh, so, why don't you come along, Harry? Demanded Slughorn. Well, I've had Quidditch practice, Professor, said Harry, who had indeed been scheduling practice practices every time Slughorn had sent him a little violet ribbon adorned invitation. Very clever. This strategy meant that Ron was not left out, and they usually had a laugh, with Ginny imagining Hermione shut up with McLagan and Zabini. Well, I certainly expect you to win your first match after all this hard work, said Slughorn. 
But a little recreation never hurt anybody. Now, how about Monday night? You can't possibly want to practice in this weather. <laughs> I, I can't, Professor. I've got a, an appointment with Professor Dumbledore that evening. Unlucky again! cried Slughorn dramatically. Ah, well... You can't evade me forever, Harry! And with a regal wave, he waddled out of the shop, taking as little notice of Ron as though he had been a display of cockroach cluster. <laughs> uh. Oh yeah, the debate's happening today. You can watch the highlights afterwards. I'm going to. Um, I can't believe you've wriggled out of another one, said Hermione, shaking her head. They're not that bad, you know. They're even quite fun sometimes. But then she caught sight of Ron's expression. Oh, look. They're got, they've got deluxe sugar quills. Those would last hours. Glad that Hermione had changed the subject, Harry showed much more interest in the new extra-large sugar quills than he would normally have done. But Ron continued to look moody and merely shrugged when Hermione asked him where he wanted to go next. Uh, uh, let's go to the three broom broomsticks, said Harry. It'll be warm. They bundled their scarves back over their faces and, the sweet sh uh, and left the sweet shop. The bitter wind was like knives on their faces after the sugary warmth of honeydukes. The street was not very busy. Nobody was lingering to chat, just hurrying towards their destinations. The exceptions were two men a little ahead of them, standing just outside the three, bro three broomsticks. One was very tall and thin. Squinting through his rain-washed glasses, Harry recognized the barman who worked in the other Hogsmeade pub, the Hog's Head. As Harry, Ron, and Hermione drew closer, the barman drew his cloak more tightly around his neck and walked away, leaving the shorter man to fumble with something in his arms. They were barely feet from him when Harry realized who the man was. Mundungus! The squat, bandy-legged man with long, strangly ginger hair jumped and dropped an ancient suitcase, which burst open, releasing what looked like the entire contents of a junk shop window. Okay, Mundungus. Oh yeah, he, he's that um, Cockney guy, right? Oh, hello, Harry, said Mundungus Fletcher, with a, with a most unconvincing stab at airiness. Well, don't let me keep you. Hmm? And he began scrabbling on the ground to retrieve the contents of his suitcase with every appearance of a man eager to be gone. Are you selling this stuff? asked Harry, watching Mundungus grabbing an assortment of grubby-looking objects from the ground. Oh, well, got a scrape. Uh, got a scrape of living, <laughs> said Mundungus. Give me that! Ron had stooped down and picked up something silver. Hang on, Ron said slowly. This looks familiar. Uh, I'm a female Muslim convert, so keep away from the debate in the states right now. Uh, oh yeah, I this 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 has always always been uh, politics free, any sorts of politics. That's what this space is for. Never will discuss it. Never have. Yeah. Uh, thank you," said Mundungus, snatching a goblet out of Ron's hand and stuffing it back into the case. Well, I'll show you all. Ouch! Harry had pinned Mundungus against the wall of the pub by the throat. Oh, what? Holding him fast with one hand, he pulled out his wand. Harry! squealed Hermione. You took that from Sirius's house, said Harry, who was almost nose to nose with Mundungus and was breathing in an unpleasant smell of old tobacco and spirits that had the Black Family crest on it. <coughs> I, no! <coughs> what? spluttered Mundungus, who was turning slowly purple. What did you do? Go back the night he died and strip the place? snarled Harry. I, I, no! Give it to me! Harry, you mustn't! shrieked Hermione, as Mundungus slowly turned to, uh, to blue. There was a bang, and Harry felt his hands fly off Mundungus's throat. Gasping and spluttering, Mundungus seized his fallen case, then crack! He dissipated. Okay, this apparated. Harry swore at the top of his voice, spinning onto the spot on the spot to see where Mundungus had gone. Come back, you thieving! There's no point, Harry. Tonk had appeared out of nowhere, her mousy hair wet with sleet. Um, um, okay, wait. He... He had the Goblet of Fire? 
Now, I'm sorry, but I've completely forgotten what the Goblet of Fire does. I thought it was just where they put their names into for the competition. Maybe it's not the Goblet of Fire, so if it's not, don't, don't worry about it. Don't you worry about it. Um, Tonks had appeared out of nowhere, her mousy hair wet with sleet. Mundungus will probably be in London. Uh, Mundungus will probably be in London by now. There's no point yelling. He's nicked Sirius's stuff. Nicked it. Yes, but still, said Tonks, who seemed perfectly untroubled by this piece of information. You should get out of the cold. She watched them through the door of the three broomsticks. The moment he was inside, Harry burst out. He was nicking Sirius's stuff. I know, Harry, but please don't shout. People are staring, whispered Hermione. Go and sit down. I'll get you a drink. Harry was still fuming when Hermione returned. He's got an anger problem, huh? He's got a real anger problem. Harry was still fuming when Hermione returned to their table a few minutes later, holding three bottles of butterbeer. Can't the order control Mundungus? Harry demanded of the other two in a furious whisper. Can't they at least stop him stealing everything that th that's not fixed down when he's at headquarters? Shh, said Hermione desperately, looking around to make sure nobody was listening. There was a couple of warlocks sitting close by who were staring at Har Harry with great interest. And Zabini was lolling against a pillar not far away. <laughs> Sorry, I had to make the joke. I had to make the joke. It was an easy one, but I had to. It's just inside of me, that, and I just had to get it out. Harry, I'd be annoyed too. I know, I know it's your things he's stealing. Harry gagged on his butterbeer. He'd momentarily forgotten that he owned number 12, Grimmauld Place. <laughs> yeah, it's my stuff. He said, no wonder he wasn't pleased to see me. Well, I'm going to tell Dumbledore what's going on. He's the only one who scares Mundungus. Good idea, whispered Hermione, clearly pleased that Harry was calming down. Ron, what are you staring at? Nothing, said Ron, hastily looking away from the bar. But Harry knew that he was trying to catch the eye of the curvy and attractive barmaid, Madame Rosemurta, from whom he had long nursed a soft spot. <laughs> Rosemurta, can you come over here and give me a beer and walk away slowly, please? I don't know why Ron sounded um, more like Mundungus than normal. <laughs> the teenage angst anger is real with Harry so far. Very true. It, it, well, it's always been real, hasn't it? The last, At least the last, this book and the last two books, it's been teenage angst, angst, angst with Harry. Just a lot of unresolved anger. And it makes sense. Not criticizing him. Just, it's there a lot. Hermione's like the rock in that group. <laughs> That's true. That's very true, Erica. Um, mm, 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 mm. Oh, yeah. Rose, uh, Smirta. I expect nothing's in the back getting more fire whiskey, <laughs> said Hermione waspishly. Ron ignored this jibe, sitting, sipping his drink in what he evidently considered to be a di dignified silence. Hmm. Harry was thinking about Sirius and how he hate, had hated those silver goblets anyway. Hermione drummed her fingers on the table, her eyes flickering between Ron and the bar. <laughs> oh, jealousy. The moment Harry drained the last drops in his bottle, she said, Shall we call it a day and go back to school then? The other two nodded. It had not been a fun trip and the weather was getting worse the longer they stayed. Once again, they drew their cloaks tightly around them, rearranged their scarves, pulled on their gloves, then followed Katie Bell and a friend out of the pub and back up the high street. Harry's thoughts strayed to Ginny as they trudged up the road to Hogwarts through the frozen slush. They had not met up with her, undoubtedly, thought Harry, because she and Dean were cozily closeted in Madame Puttyfoot's tea shop, that haunt of happy couples. Scowling, he bowed his head against the swirling sleet and trudged on. Harry, Harry, Harry. Harry's got thoughts. Harry's got thoughts he's got to pursue. He can't help himself. Cho Chang is out of the picture. In one ear, out the other. And let's put Ginny in that ear. Squash her in and now she's in his head. It was a little while before Harry became aware that the voices of Katie Bell and her friend, which were being carried back to him on the wind, had become shriller and louder. 
Harry squinted at their indistinct frames. The two girls were having an argument about something Katie was holding in her hand. Um, Katie, oh yeah. It's got nothing to do with you, Leanne, Harry heard Katie say. They ra rounded a corner in the lane, sleet coming thick and fast, blurring Harry's glasses. Just as he raised a gloved hand to wipe them, Leanne made to grab hold of the package Katie was holding. Katie tugged it back, and the package fell to the ground. At once, Katie rose into the air, not as Ron had done, suspended comically by the ankle, but gracefully, her arms outstretched as though she were about to fly. Yet there was something wrong, something eerie. Her hair was whipped around her by the fierce wind, but her eyes were closed, and her face was quite empty of expression. Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Leanne had all halt halted in their tracks, watching. Then, six feet above the ground, Katie let out a terrible scream. Her eyes flew open, but whatever she could see or whatever she was feeling was clearly causing her terrible anguish. She screamed and screamed. Leanne started to scream too and seized Katie's ankles, trying to tug her back to the ground. Harry, Ron, and Hermione rushed forwards to help, but even as they grabbed Katie's legs, she fell on top of them. Harry and Ron managed to catch her, but she was writhing so much they could hardly hold her. Instead, they lowered her to the ground where she thrashed and screamed, apparently unable to recognize any of them. Harry looked around. The landscape seemed deserted. Stay there, he shouted at the others of the howling wind. I'm going for help. He began to sprint towards the school. He had never seen anyone behave as Katie had just done and could not think what had caused it. He hurtled round a bend in the lane and collided with what seemed to be an enormous bear on its hind legs. What the heck? Hagrid, oh, he panted, disentangling himself from the hedgerow in which he had fallen. Arre! said Hagrid, with sleet trapped in his eyebrows and beard, and was wearing his great shaggy beaver-skin coat. Just been visiting Grop. He's coming on so well, you wouldn't. Hagrid, someone's hurt back there, or, or, or cursed, or, or something. What? said Hagrid, bending lower to hear what Harry was saying over the raging wind. Someone's been cursed, bellowed Harry. Cursed? Who's been cursed? Not Ron. Hermione. No, it's not them. It's Katie Bell. This way. Together they ran back along the lane. It took them no time to find the little group of people around Katie, who was still writhing and screaming on the ground. Ron, Hermione, and Leanne were all trying to quieten her. Get back, shouted Hagrid. Let me see her. Uh, something's happened to her, sobbed Leanne. I don't know what. Hagrid stared at Katie for a second, then, without a word, bent down, scooped her into his arm, and ran off towards the castle with her. Within seconds, Katie's piercing screams had died away, and the only sound was the roar of the wind. Harry hurried, Harry, oh no, Harry hurried over to Katie's wailing friend and put an arm around her. It's Leanne, oh no, it's Leanne, isn't it? The girl nodded. Did it just happen all of a sudden, or it was when that package tore, sobbed Leanne, pointing at the now sodden brown paper, paper package on the ground which had split open to reveal a greenish glitter. Ron bent down, his hand outstretched, but Harry seized his arm and pulled him back. Don't touch it! He crouched down. An ornate opal necklace was visible, poking out of the newspaper. I've seen that before, said Harry, staring at the thing. It was only on display in Borgen and Burke's ages ago. The label said it was cursed. Katie must have touched it. He looked up at Leanne had started to shake uncontrollably. How did Katie get hold of this? Um. Well, that's why, the, why, why we were arguing. She came back from the bathroom in the three broomsticks holding it. Said it was a surprise for someone at Hogwarts and she had to deliver it. She looked all funny when she said it. Oh, no, oh, no, I know, I know, but she's been imperious and I didn't realize. Leanne shook with renewed sobs. Hermione patted her j shoulder gently. She didn't say who'd given it to her, Leanne. No, she wouldn't tell me. And I said she was being stupid and not to, t uh, not to take it up to school, but she just wouldn't listen. And, and then I tried to grab it from her and... and. Leanne let out a wail of despair. 
We better get up to school, said Hermione, her arm still around Leanne. We'll be able to find out how she is. Come on. Harry hesitated for a second, then pulled his scarf from around his face, and ignoring Ron's gr gasp, carefully covered the necklace in it and picked it up. We need to show this to Madame Pumphrey, he said. As they followed Hermione and Leanne up the road, Harry was thinking furiously. They had just entered the grounds when he spoke, unable to keep his thoughts to himself any longer. Malfoy, no Malfoy knows about this necklace. It was in a case at Borgen and Burke's four years ago. I saw him having a good look at it while I was hiding from him and his dad. This is what he was buying that day when, he w when we followed him. He remembered it and he went back for it. I, I don't know, Harry, said Ron hesitantly. Loads of people go to Borgen and Burke's. And didn't that girl Katie got uh, and that didn't that girl say Katie got it in the girl's bathroom? She said she came back from the bathroom with it. She didn't necessarily get it in the bathroom itself. McGonagall said Ron warningly. Harry looked up. Sure enough, Professor McGonagall was hurrying down the stone steps through swirling sleet to meet them. Hagrid says you four saw what happened to Katie Bell. Upstairs to my office at once, please. What's that you're holding, Potter? It's the thing she touched, said Harry. Good Lord, said Professor McGonagall, looking alarmed as she took the necklace from Harry. No, no, Filch, there with me, she added hastily, as Filch came shuffling eagerly across the entrance hall, holding his secrecy sensor aloft. Take this necklace to Professor Snape at once, but be sure not to touch it. Keep it wrapped in the scarf. Harry and the others followed Professor McGonagall upstairs and into her office. Slytherin. That's a really good metal ba death, band <laughs> death metal band name, Timon. Slytherin. Woo! I can't, I, I can't, I wonder if really want to sing that high, but I can't. Um, Okay. The sleet splattered windows were rattling in their frames, and the room was chilly despite the fire crackling in the grate. Professor McGonagall closed the door and swept round her desk to face Harry, Ron, Hermione, and the still sobbing Leanne. Well, she said sharply, what happened? Haltingly, and with many pauses while she attempted to control her crying, Leanne told Professor McGonagall how Katie had gone to the bathroom and the three broomsticks and returned holding the unmarked package. How Katie had seemed a little odd, and how they had argued about the advisability of agreeing to deliver unknown objects, the argument culminating in the tussle of the parcel, which tore open. At this point, Leanne was so overcome, there was no getting another word out of her. I love how you impersonate Minerva McGonagall. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Mo Sarah. I'm glad you do. Mella. Mella? German? I don't know. I'm willing to call John Bott's earlier premonition accurate. This was definitely shocking, and you all know it pains me to ever say John's correct. Well, you must be in pain every single time I make a premonition, then, Lois. You must be in abject pain every single time, because I couldn't be more accurate. I mean, check, check the logs. All the logs that you've written down. They're all correct. Um, all right, said Professor McGonagall, not unki unkindly. Go up to the hospital wing, please, Leanne. Get Madame Pumphrey to give you something for shock. When she, had, when she had left the room, Professor McGonagall turned back to Harry, Ron, and Hermione. What happened when Katie touched the necklace? She rose up in the air, said Harry, before either Ron or Hermione could speak, and then began to scream and collapsed. Professor, can I see Professor Dumbledore, please? The headmaster is away until Monday, Potter, said Professor McGonagall, looking surprised. Away? Harry repeated angrily. Yes, Potter, away, said Professor McGonagall tartly. But anything you have to say about this horrible business can be said to me, I'm sure. For a split second, Harry hesitated. Professor McGonagall did not invite confidences. Dumbledore, though in many ways more intimate, intimidating, still seemed less likely, likely to scorn a theory, however wild. Uh, this was a life-and-death matter, though, and no moment to worry about being laughed out. I think, I think Draco Malfoy gave Katie that necklace, Professor. On one side of him, Ron rubbed his nose in apparent embarrassment. On the other, Hermione shuffled her feet as though quite keen to put a bit of distance between herself and Harry. That is a very serious accusation, Potter, 
said Professor, Professor McGonagall after a shocked pause. Do you have any proof? No, said Harry. But, and he told her about following Malfoy to Borgen and Burks, and the conversation they had overheard between him and Borgen. When he had finished speaking, Professor McGonagall looked slightly confused. Malfoy took something to Borgen and Burks for a pair. No, Professor, he, he just wanted Borgen to tell him how to mend something. He didn't have it with him. But that's not the point. The thing is that he bought something at the same time, and I think it was that necklace. You saw Malfoy leave in the shop with a similar package. No, Professor, he told Borgen to keep it in the shop for him. But Harry, Hermione interrupted, Borgen asked him if he wanted to take it with him, and he, Malfoy said no. Because he didn't want to touch it, obviously, said Harry angrily. What he actually said was, how would I look carrying that down the street, said Hermione. Well, he would look a bit of a prat carrying a necklace, interjected Ron. Oh, Ron, said Hermione despairingly, it would all be wrapped up, so you wouldn't have to touch it, and quite easy to hide inside a cloak, so nobody saw it, would see it. I think whatever he, he reserved at Borgen and Burke's was noisy or, or bulky, something he knew would draw attention to him if he carried it down the street. And in, in, and in any case, she pressed on loudly before Harry could interrupt. I asked Borgen about the necklace, don't you remember? When I went in to try and find out what uh, Malfoy had asked him to keep, I saw it there. And Borgen just told me the price. He didn't say it was already sold or anything. Well, you were really being really obvious. He realized what you were up to within about five seconds. Of course he wasn't go going to tell you. Anyway, Malfoy could have sent off for it once. That's enough, said Professor McGonagall. As Hermione opened her mouth to retort, looking furious. Potter! I appreciate you telling me telling me this, but we but we cannot point the finger of blame at Mr. Malfoy purely because he visited the shop where his necklace might have been purchased. The same is probably true of hundreds of people. That's what I said, muttered Ron. <laughs> Doesn't contribute at all. Yeah, I know, right? And and in any case, we've put string we have put stringent security measures in place this year. I do not believe that Necklace can possibly, possibly have entered the school without our knowledge. But, and what is more, said Professor McGonagall, with an air of awful finality, Mr. Malfoy was not in Hogsmeade today. Harry gaped at her, deflating. How do you know, Professor? Because he was doing detention with me. He has now failed to complete his transfiguration homework twice in a row. So thank you for telling me your, su your suspicions, Potter, she said as she marched past them. But I need to go up to the hospital wing now to check on Katie Bell. <sighs> Good day to you all. She held open her office door. They had no choice but to file past her without another word. I like McGonagall. She's fair. She's fair. She's fair. Twice in a row. <laughs> True. Um, Harry was angry with the other two for siding with McGonagall. Nevertheless, he felt compelled to join in once they started discussing what had happened. So who do you reckon Katie was supposed to give the necklace to? Asked Ron as they climbed the stairs to the common room. Goodness only knows, said Hermione. But whoever it was had a narrow escape. No one, no one could have opened that package without touching the necklace. It could have been meant for loads of people, said Harry. Dumbledore, the Death Eaters, would love to get rid of him. Sorry, one second. Um, he must be one of their top targets. Or Slughorn. Dumbledore re reckons Voldemort really wanted him, and they can't be pleased that he sided with Dumbledore. Or, or you, said Hermione, looking troubled. <laughs> looking troubled? <sighs> Couldn't have been, said Harry. Or Katie would have just turned round in the lane and given it to me, wouldn't she? I was behind her all the way um, out of the three broomsticks. It would have made much more sense to deliver the parcel outside Hogwarts, but with Filch searching everyone who goes in and out. I wonder why Malfoy told her to take it in the, in, into the castle. Harry, Malfoy wasn't in Hogsmeade, said Hermione, actually stamping her foot in frustration. He must have used an accomplice then, said Harry. Crabbe or Goyel or... Come to think of it, another Death Eater. He loved loads 
better cronies than Crabbe and Goyel. Now he's joined up. Ron and Hermione exchanged looks that plainly said, there's no point in arguing with him. <laughs> Dilly Grout, said Hermione firmly as they reached the fat lady. The portrait, swung, the portrait swung open to admit them to the common room. It was quite full and smelled of damp clothing. Many people seemed to have returned from Hogsmeade early because of the bad weather. There was no buzz of fear or speculation, however. Clearly, the news of Katie's fade had not yet spread. It wasn't a very slick attack, really, when you stop and think about it, said Ron, casually turfing a first year out out of one of the good armchairs by the fire <laughs> so that he could sit down. The curse didn't even make it into the castle. Not what you call foolproof. You're right, said Hermione, prodding Ron out of the chair with her foot and offering it to the first here again. <laughs> That's so great. It's so great. It says so much about the relationship. It wasn't very uh, well thought out at all. But since when has Malfoy been one of the world's greatest thinkers, said, said, asked Harry. Neither Ron nor Hermione answered him. Okay, end of chapter. Chapter 13, The Secret Riddle. Ah, McGon McGonagall's fair. I like her. Yes, strict but fair, and treats all houses the same. Very true. Yeah. Not like Snape. Uh, that big cup. It is a vase. Well, apparently. I don't know if that's true. It could be. But it's a perfect size for me. Oh! Have a biscuit, Potter, remain McGonagall's best ever line. Very true. I love that line. It's such a good line. Um, okay. So, I think... What do you think? I don't think the necklace had anything to do with Draco. Draco's got something else he's working on. And has nothing to do with this separate plan somebody else has. Katie Bell looking weird. And we also had Mundungus popping in with a he brought right, he brought a cup from um, Sirius's or now Harry's house from Gribbled Place. He brought a cup and there was this other thin guy, right? Who's the other? Oh, he was the bar, the bar guy. So, what I think probably happened is that, is that Mundungus, he's, he's using those cups for payment to pay somebody to do something. That person, you know, bewitched Katie Bell, put a, cur put a spell on her, and Katie was supposed to probably bring it in, uh, not not quite smuggle it in, probably leave it somewhere outside or something like that. But Leanne disrupted that plan. Draco's got something else completely going on. Who do, we, who do you think did it? Who do I think which Katie Bell? Well, I, it definitely has something to do with Mundungus. Although it's not it's not from the Death Eaters. It's not... Uh, what does that necklace do? Wait, no, wait, wait, wait. Oh, well, 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 well. oh, I am mystified. I am mystified right now. All right, let's keep going. We got 25 minutes left. Chapter 13, The Secret Riddle. Does that have to have something to do with Tom Riddle? I bet it does. I bet it has something to do with Tom Riddle. Yeah, come on now. Come on now. Is this all an official premonition that you want me recording? Um, I, I mean, I kind of made a premonition. I, I, I'm, I'm, I kind of weeded it out. I, I said this isn't about Draco. Yeah, yeah, this is not Draco's plan. Whatever that has to do with the necklace, that has has to do with Mundungus, who made this incident happen somehow. He's working for somebody else. So there's two different plans happening. Katie was removed to St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries the following day, by which time the news that she had been cursed had spread all over the school. Though the details were confused and nobody other than Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Leanne seemed to know that Katie herself had not been the intended target. Oh, and Malfoy knows, of course, said Harry to Ron and Hermione, who, conti who continued their new policy of feigning deafness whenever Harry mentioned his Malfoy is a Death Eater theory. 
Harry had wondered whether Dumbledore would return from whatever he had been in time, for wherever he had been in time for Monday's night's lesson. But having no word to the contrary, he presented himself outside Dumbledore's office at eight o'clock, knocked, and was told to enter. There sat Dumbledore, looking unusually tired. His hand was as black and burned as ever, but he smiled when he gestured to Harry to sit down. The pensive was sitting on the desk again, casting silvery specks of lights over the ceiling. Oh, we're going to go on another adventure. That's cool. That's cool. What, what, uh, perfect dex cam moment. I don't know what dex did. <laughs> oh, he came out and licked or something like that. You have had a busy time. You have had a busy time while I've been away. Dumbledore said, I believe you witnessed Katie's accident. Yes, sir. How is she? Still very unwell. Although she was re relatively lucky, she appeared to have brushed the necklace with the smallest possible amount of skin. There was a tiny hole in her glove. Had she put it on, had she even held it in her ungloved hand, she would have died, perhaps instantly. Luckily, Professor Snape was able to do enough to prevent a rapid spread of the curse. Why him? asked Harry quickly. Why not Madame Pomfrey? Impertinent, said a soft voice from one of the portraits on the wall. And Phineas Nigellus Black, Sirius's great-great-grandfather, raised his head from his arms where, where he had appeared to be sleeping. Oh, yeah, is this the kind of like... Oh, God, a drunk guy. That's... I would not have permitted a student to question the way. I, I would not have permitted a student to question the way Hogwarts operated in my day. Oh, no, he's that... Oh, right, he's that super old previous... Right, okay. Right, cynical... Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I... right, 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 right. Okay. Um... Yes, yes, thank you, Phineas, Phineas, said Dumbledore quellingly. Professor Snape knows much more about the dark arts than Madame Pomfrey, Harry. Anyway, the St. Mungo staff are sending me hourly reports, and I'm hopeful that Katie will make a full recovery in time. Where were you this weekend, sir? Harry asked, disregarding a strong feeling that he might be pushing his luck, a feeling apparently shared by fin F Phineas Nigellus, who hissed softly. Sss. I would rather not say just now said Dumbledore. However, I shall tell you in due course. You will, said Harry, startled. Yes, I expect so, said Dumbledore, withdrawing a, f withdrawing a fresh bottle of silver memories from inside his robes and uncorking it with a prod of his wand. Sir, said Harry tentatively, I met Mundungus in Hogsmeade. Ah, yes. I'm already aware that Mundungus has been treating your inheritance with light-fingered contempt, said Dumbledore, frowning a little. He has gone on to ground since you... He has, he has gone to ground since you accosted him outside the three broomsticks. I rather think he dreads facing me. However, however, rest assured that he will not be making away with any more of Sirius's old possessions. That mangy half blood has been stealing black heirlooms, said Phineas Nigellus, incensed. Oh, that mangy old half blood has been stealing black heirlooms, said Phineas Nigellus, incensed, and he stalked out of out of his frame, frame, undoubtedly to visit his portraits in Number Twelve, Grimmauld Place. Professor, said Harry after a short pause, did Professor McGonagall tell you what I told her after Katie got hurt? About Draco Malfoy. She told me about your suspicions. Yes, said Dumbledore. And do you... I shall take all appropriate measures to investigate anyone who might have had a hand in Katie's accident, said Dumbledore. But what concerns me now, Harry, is our lesson. Harry felt slightly resentful at this. If their lessons were so very important, why had there been such a long gap between the first and second? However, he had said no more about Draco Malfoy, but watched as, D as Dumbledore poured the fresh memories into the pensive and began swirling the stone basin once more between his long-fingered hands. Um, 
you will remember, I am sure, that we left the tale of Lord Voldemort's beginnings at the point where the, hunt, where the handsome muggle Tom Riddle had abandoned his witch wife Merope and returned to his fa family home in Little Hangleton. Merope was left alone in London, expecting the baby who would one day become Lord Voldemort. One second. Um, I I'm a bit confused. Wasn't Voldemort's old name Tom Riddle? Is he just Tom Riddle Jr.? Is it Tom Riddle Sr. and Tom Riddle Jr.? You know, correct me if I'm wrong here. How do you know she was in London, sir? Because of the evidence of one Caracactus Burke. Carac... Caractacus... Caractacus Burke, said Dumbledore. Who... By an odd coincidence, helped found the very shop whence came the necklace we have just been discussing. Yes, okay, Junior Kaina. He swirled the contents of the pensieve as Harry had seen him swill them before, much as a gold prospector sifts for gold. Up out of the swirling silvery mass rose a little man, resolving, revolving slowly in the pensieve, silver as a ghost, but much more solid, with a thatch of hair that completely covered his eyes. Uh, wait, who is this? Oh, this is um, this is the the dude who was in the old memory, uh, the 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 um, Auror, right? I'm guessing it's the Auror. Yes, we acquired it in a yes, we acquired it in curious circumstances was brought in by a young witch just before Christmas. Oh, many years ago now. I, am I right here? Is that him? Oh, no, no. Ca oh, this is a new character. Caracactus Burke. Car Caractacus Burke. Okay, it's a new character. Yes, uh, we acquired it in cure circumstances. It was brought in by a young witch just before Christmas. Uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, she said she needed the gold badly. Well, that was mu that much was obvious. Covered in rags and pretty far along. Mm -hmm. Going to have a baby, see? Huh? She said the locket had been Slytherin's. Well, we hear that sort of story all the time. Oh, this was Merlin's. This was his favourite teapot. But when I looked at it, it had his mark all right. And a few simple spells were enough to tell me the truth. Of course, that made it near enough priceless. She didn't seem to have any idea how much it was worth. Happy to get ten gallons for it. Best bargain we ever made. I don't know if that's the right person, but... Uh, hello, Helen. Welcome, Helen. First time on your, on your, on the chat. Dumbledore gave the pensive an extra vigorous shake and Caractacus, oh man, Caractacus, Caractacus, Burke descended back into the swirling mass of memory whence he had come. He only gave her ten galleons, said Harry indignantly. Caractacus Burke was not framed for... Caractacus Burke was not famed for his generosity, said Dumbledore. So we know that near the end of her pregnancy, the rope was alone in London and in desperate need of gold. Okay, one second. Uh, so he got the necklace off of Merope, right? Merope had to give his necklace away. And at, was, at that time, it seems like it wasn't some crazy... So, you know, it, it, was, it was a historical item, but I don't know if it had, like, that crazy curse on it. He's a shop owner Draco talked to, I thought. Oh, oh, no, that's Borgens, right. You have to say that. You won't ever have to say that name again. Okay, cool. Thanks, Kamani. She pawned the locket. Okay. Um. So we know that near the end of her pregnancy, Merope was alone in London and in desperate need of gold. Desperate enough to sell her one and only valuable possession. The locket that was one of Mar 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 Marvolo's treasured family heirlooms. But she could do magic, said Harry impatiently. She, she could have got food and everything herself by magic, couldn't she? 
Ah, said Dumbledore. Perhaps she could, but it is my belief, I am guessing again, but I am sure I am right, that when her husband abandoned her, the rope is stopped using magic. I do not think that she wanted to be a witch any longer, of course. It is also possible that her unrequited love and the attendant despair sapped her of her powers. That can happen. In any case, as you are about to see, the rope here refused to raise her wand even to save her own life. She wouldn't even stay alive for her son. Dumbledore raised her, his eyebrows. Could you possibly be feeling sorry for Lord Voldemort? No, said Harry quickly. But she had a choice, didn't she? Not like my mother. Your mother had a choice, too, said Dumbledore gently. Yes, the Ropey Riddle chose death in spite of the son who needed her. But do not judge her too harshly, Harry. She was greatly weakened by long suffering, and she never had your mother's courage. And now, if you will stand... Where are we going? Harry asked, as Dumbledore joined him at the front of the desk. This time, said Dumbledore, we are going to enter my memory. I think you will find it both rich in detail and satisfyingly accurate. <laughs> After you, Harry. Harry bent over the pensive. His face broke the cool surface of the memory, and he was falling through darkness again. Seconds later, his f feet hit firm ground. He opened his eyes and found that he and Dumbledore were standing in a bustling, old-fashioned London street. There I am, said Dumbledore brightly, pointing ahead of them to a tall figure crossing the road in front of a horse-drawn milk cart. I wonder how young he is. This younger Albus Dumbledore, Albus Dumbledore's long hair and be beard were auburn. Oh, okay. Bow, da, 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 bow, wow. Having reached their side of the street, he strode off along the pavement, drawing many curious glances due to the flamboyant cut suit of plum velvet he was wearing. Damn! Damn, Dumbledore was swaggering! <laughs> uh, I feel so, so sorry for Moropi. Yeah, me too. Yeah, sad story, really. Nice suit, sir, said Harry, before he could stop himself. But Dumbledore, Dumbledore merely chuckled <laughs> as they followed his younger self a short distance, finally passing through a set of iron gates into a bare courtyard that fronted a rather grim square building, surrounded by high railings. He mounted the, th uh, the few steps leading to the front door and knocked once. After a moment or two, the door was opened by a scruffy girl wearing an apron. Okay, um, I'm going to have to give Dumbledore a younger voice. There we go. That's his voice. Younger, a bit more sprite, and not as old. Good afternoon. I have an appointment with a Mrs. Cole, who, I believe, is the matron here. Oh, said the bewildered-looking girl, taking in Dumbledore's eccentric appearance. Um, just a no. Mrs. Cole! <laughs> she bellowed over her shoulder. <laughs> Harry heard a distant voice shouting in response. The girl turned back to Dumbledore. Uh, Come in, she's on her way. Dumbledore stepped back, uh, stepped into a hallway tiled. So Mrs. Cole, I can't remember if we met Mrs. Cole or not. Into a hallway tiled in black and white. The whole place was shabby but spotlessly clean. Harry and the older Dumbledore followed. Before the front door had closed behind them, a skinny, harassed-looking woman came scurrying towards them. She had, she had a sharp-featured face that appeared more anxious than unkind, and she was talking over her shoulder to another aproned helper as she, was, as she walked towards Dumbledore. A skinny, harassed-looking woman came scurrying towards them. Okay, d uh, please give me some adjectives for Cole. We have some adjectives. In my mind, Dumbledore has had this voice since he was a child. <laughs> it just came, came, just comes out of the womb. Oh my, that was a good nap. My gosh, who are you people? Oh, oh, I'm born, am I? 
Oh, well, here we go. Strongest wizard on Earth already. One day Dumbledore appeared and he was just how he was now, yeah. Freezing. She, oh, great adjective, Eva May. Freezing. Talkative. Freezing. Freezing. See, harassed looking woman. Freezing and harassed. And take the iodine upstairs to Martha. Billy Stumps has been picking his scabs and Eric Worley's oozing all over his sheets. Chicken box on top of everything else, she said to nobody in particular. And then her eyes fell upon Dumbledore and she stopped dead in her tracks, looking as astonished as if a giraffe had just crossed her threshold. Um, good afternoon, good afternoon, said Dumbledore, holding out his hand. Mrs. Cole simply gaped. My name is Albus Dumbledore. I sent you a letter requesting an appointment, and you very kindly invited me here today. Mrs. Cole blinked, apparently deciding that Dumbledore was not a hallucination. She said feebly, Oh, yeah, uh, freezing and, and harassed. Oh, uh, yes. Well, well, then, you'd better come into my room. Yes. She led Dumbledore into a small room that seemed part sitting office, part office. It was as shabby as the hallway, and the furniture was old and mismatched. She, invite, invite, she invited Dumbledore to sit on a rickety chair and seated herself behind a cluttered desk, eyeing him nervously. I'm here, as I told you in my letter, to discuss Tom Riddle and arrangements for his future, said Dumbledore. Are you family? No. Oh, it's going to be hard to switch between the two. Dumbledore talks over here, and and cold. Cold is cold. C um, freezing. Freezing and harassed. Freezing and freezing. There we go. Now I got her. Here she is. And here's he's over there. Are you family? Asked Mr. Mrs. Cole. No, I am a teacher, said Dumbledore. I have come to offer Tom a place at my school. What school is this, then? No, what school is this, then? It is called Hogwarts, said Dumbledore. And how come you're interested in Tom? We believe he, we believe he has qualities we're looking for. You mean he's won a scholarship? How can, how can he have done? He's never entered for one. Well, his name has been down for our school since birth. Who registered him? His parents? There was no doubt that Mrs. Cole was inco an inconveniently sharp woman. Apparently, Dumbledore thought so too, for Harry now saw him slip his wand out of the pocket of his velvet suit, at the same time picking up a piece of perfectly blank paper from Mrs. Cole's desktop. You should be on Broadway, or be a professional reader of the faces you pull. On point. <laughs> well, I've done lots of plays. Uh, I've not moved to New York, so I can't be on Broadway yet. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. That's very nice. Uh, these aren't the droids you're looking for. <laughs> yeah, said Dumbledore, waving his wand once as he passed through the piece of paper. I think this will make everything uh, everything clear. Mrs. Cole's eyes slid out of focus and back again as she gazed intently at the black blank paper for a moment. That seems perfectly in order, she said placidly, handing it back. Then her eyes fell upon a bottle of gin and two glasses that had certainly not been present a few seconds before. Um, may, I offer, may I offer you a glass of gin, she said in an extra refined voice. Uh, may I offer you, may I offer you a glass of gin, she said in an extra refined voice. Thank you very much said Dumbledore, beaming. It soon became clear that Mrs. Cole was no novice when it came to gin drinking. Pouring both of them a generous measure, she drained her own glass in one. Smacking her lips frankly, she smiled at Dumbledore for the first time, and he didn't hesitate to press his advantage. I was wondering whether you could tell me anything of Tom Riddle's history. I think he was born here, in the orphanage. That's right. Oh, Oh, I keep losing her voice. Uh, uh, what was it? It's very freezing. Freezing and agitated. That's right. That's right. That That's right. Said Miss, that's right. Oh, forward. She's very forward. That's right. 
said Mrs. Cole, helping her to more gin. I remember it clear as anything, because I'd just started here myself. New Year's Eve and bitter cold, snowing, you know, nasty night. And this girl, not much older than I was myself at the time, came staggering up the front steps. Well, she wasn't the first. We took her in, and he had the baby within the hour. And she was dead in another hour. Mrs. Cole nodded impressively and took another g generous gulp of gin. Did she say anything before she died? asked Dumbledore. Anything about the boy's father, for instance? No, as it happens, she did, said Mrs. Cole, who seemed to be rather enjoying herself now, with the gin in her hand and an eager audience for her story. I remember she said to me, I hope he looks like his papa, and I won't lie. She was right to hope it, because <laughs> she was no beauty. <laughs> and then she told me he was to be named Tom, for his father and Marvolo, for her father. Yes, I know. Funny name, isn't it? We wondered whether she came from a circus, and she said the boy's surname was to be Riddle, and she died soon after without another word. Well, uh, well we named him just as she'd said. It seemed so important to the poor girl. But no Tom nor Marvolo nor any kind of riddle ever came looking for him, nor any family at all. So he stayed in the orphanage and he's been here ever since. Mrs. Cole helped herself almost absent-mindedly to another healthy measure of gin. She's just down in it. Two pink spots had appeared high on her cheekbones. Then she said, He's a funny boy. Yes, said Dumbledore. I thought he might be. He was a funny baby, too. He's, he hardly ever cried, you know. And then, when he got a little older, he was... Odd. Odd? Odd? In what way? Uh, in what way? Asked Dumbledore gently. Well, he... he... But Mrs. Cole pulled up short, and there was nothing blurry or vague about the inquisitorial glance she shot Dumbledore over her gin glass. Um, he's definitely got a place at your school, you say? Definitely, said Dumbledore. And nothing, I say, can change that? Nothing, said Dumbledore. You'll be taking him away. Whatever. Whatever, repeated Dumbledore gravely. She squinted at him as though deciding whether or not to trust him. Apparently she decided she could, because she said in a sudden rush, He scares the other children. You mean he's a bully? asked Dumbledore. I think he must um, I think he must be, said Mrs. Cole, frowning slightly. But it's very hard to catch him at it. There have been incidents. Nasty things. Dumbledore did not press her, though Harry could tell that he was interested. She took yet another gulp of gin, and her ch rosy cheeks grew rosier still. Billy Stubbs Rabbit. Well, Tom said he didn't do it, and I don't see how he could have, but how he could have done. But even so, it didn't hang itself from the rafters, did it? I shouldn't think so. No, said Dumbledore quietly. But I'm jiggered. If I know how he got up there to do it. All I know is he and Billy had argued the day before, and then... Mrs. Cole took another swig of gin, slopping a little over her chin this time. On the summer outing, we take them out, you know, once a year. To the countryside or to the seaside. Well, Amy Benson and Denny Bishop were never quite right afterwards. And all we ever got out of them was that they'd gone into a cave with Tom Riddle. He swore they'd just gone exploring, but something... Happened there. I'm sure of it. And well, there have been a lot of things. Funny things. She looked at Dumbledore again, and though her cheeks were flushed, her gaze was steady. I don't think many people would be sorry to see the back of him. You understand, I'm sure, that we will not be keeping him permanently, said Dumbledore. He will have to return here, at the very least, every summer. Oh, well, that's better than a whack on the nose with a rusty poker, said Mrs. Cole with a slight hiccup. <laughs> she got to her feet and Harry was impressed to see that she was quite steady, even though two-thirds of the gin was now gone. I suppose you'd like to see him? 
Very much, said Dumbledore, rising too. So he went out to get him. He knew how dangerous he was. He knew, he knew. But he, maybe he was thinking, I, maybe I can give this kid enough love that it changes him. Maybe he thought that. I don't know. She led him out of her office and up the stone stairs, calling out instructions and uh, admonishments to helpers and children, and children as she passed. The orphans, Harry saw, were all wearing the same kind of grayish tunic. They looked reasonably well cared for, but there was no denying that this was a grim place in which to grow up. Here we are, said Mrs. Cole, as they turned off the second landing and stopped outside the first door in a co long corridor. She knocked twice and entered. Tom, you've got a visitor. This is Mr. Dum uh, Dumberton. Oh, sorry. Dunderball. <laughs> Dunder Dum Dunderball. He's come to tell you. Well, I'll let him do it. Harry and the two Dumbledores entered the room, and Mrs. Cole closed the door on them. Ooh, this is interesting. Uh, isn't a small... We're at seven, but we're going to go long. Uh, how, 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 how long is this? Let's see. Okay, this is quite long. This is going for quite a while. Um, I'll go for another 20, and then we'll see. Uh, uh, where were we? Sorry. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay. It was a small, bare room with nothing in it except... I'm just going to put on the creep music, because kind of deserves it for, for him. Except an old wardrobe, a wooden chair, and an iron bedstead. A boy was sitting on top of the gray blankets, his legs stretched out in front of him, holding a book. There was no trace of the gaunts in Tom Riddle's face. Meropia had got her dying wish. He was his handsome father in miniature, tall for eleven years old, dark-haired and pale. His eyes narrowed slightly as he took in Dumbledore's eccentric appearance. There was a moment's silence. What was his voice? Tom Riddle's voice was like book two, I think. It's a long time ago. Yeah, okay. How do you do, Tom? said Dumbledore, walking forwards and holding out his hand. Maybe give me some adjectives for this kid. Again. The boy hesitated, then took it, and they shook hands. Dumbledore drew up the hard wooden chair beside Riddle. Please don't spoil anything in your adjectives. The, the pair of them looked rather like a hospital patient and visitor. I am Professor Dumbledore. This is 11-year-old Riddle, cold, commanding, even for his age. Thank you, Nat Nat Natalia. That's great. Professor, repeated Riddle. He, he, lo he looked wary. Is that like Doctor? What are you here for? Did she get you in to have a look at me? He was pointing at the door, through which Mrs. Cole had just left. No, no, said Dumbledore, smiling. I don't believe you, said Riddle. She wants me looked at, doesn't she? Tell the truth. Kind of like that. He spoke the last three words with a ringing force that was almost shocking. It was a command, and it sounded as though he had given it many times before. His eyes had widened, and he was glaring at Dumbledore, who had made no response uh, except to continue smiling pleasantly. After a few seconds, Riddle stopped glaring, though he looked, if anything, Warrior still, confident, cunning, skeptical, untrusting, snide. There you go. Who are you? I told you. My name is Professor Dumbledore, and I work at school, a school called Hogwarts. I've come to offer you a place at my school, your new school, if you would like to come. Riddle's reaction to this was most surprising. He leapt from the bed and backed away from Dumbledore, looking furious. You can't kid me! The, the asylum, that's where you... That's, uh, that's where you're from, isn't it? Professor! Yes, of course! Well, I'm not going, see? That old cat's the one who should be in the asylum. I never did anything to little Amy Benson or Denny Bishop, and you can ask them! They'll tell you! I am not from the asylum, said Dumbledore patiently. I am a teacher, and if you will sit down calmly... I shall tell you about Hogwarts, of course, if you would rather not come to the school. Nobody will force you. I'd like to see them try, sneered Riddle. Hogwarts, 
Dumbledore went on, as though he had not heard Riddle's last words, is a school for people with special abilities. I'm not mad! I know you're not mad. Hogwarts is not a school for mad people. It is a school of magic. There was a silence. Riddle had frozen, his face expressionless. But his eyes were flickering back and forth between each of Dumbledore's, as though trying to catch one of them lying. Magic, he repeated. Magic, he repeated in a whisper. That's right, said Dumbledore. It's... It's magic. What I can do. What is it you can do? All sorts, breathed Riddle. A flush of excitement was rising up his neck into his hollow cheeks. He looked fevered. I can make things move without touching them. I can, I can make animals do what I want them to do without training them. I can make bad things happen to people who annoy me. I can make them hurt if I want to. His legs were trembling. He stumbled forwards and sat down on the bed again, staring at his hands. His head bowed as though in prayer. I knew I was different, he whispered to his own quivering fingers. I knew I was special. Always. I knew there was something. Well, you were quite right, said Dumbledore, who was no longer smiling, but watched Riddle intently. You are a wizard. Riddle lifted his head. Yikes. This kid, yeah, he, uh, he's al he's already so creepy. His face was transfigured. There was a wild happiness upon it, and for some reason it did not make him better looking. On the contrary, his finely carved features seemed somehow rougher, his expression almost bestial. Are you a wizard too? Yes, uh, yes, I am. Prove it! said Riddle at once, in the same commanding tone he had used when he said, Tell the truth. Dumbledore raised his eyebrows. If, as I take it, you are accepting your place at Hogwarts, of course I am, then you will address me as Professor or Sir. Riddle's expression hardened from the most fleeting moment before he said, in an unrecognizably polite voice, I'm sorry, sir. I meant, please, Professor, could you show me? Harry was sure that Dumbledore was going to refuse, that he would tell Riddle there would be plenty of time for practical demonstrations at Hogwarts, that they were currently in a building full of muggles and must therefore be cautious. To his great surprise, however, Dumbledore drew his wand from an inside pocket of his suit jacket, pointed it at the shabby wardrobe in the corner, and gave the wand a casual flick. The wardrobe burst into flames. Riddle jumped to his feet. Harry could hardly blame him for howling in shock and rage. All his worldly possessions must have been in there. But even as Riddle rounded on Dumbledore, the flames vanished, leaving the wardrobe completely undamaged. <laughs> Riddle stared from the wardrobe to Dumbledore. Then, his expression greedy, he pointed his wand. Where can I get one of them? All in good time, said Dumbledore. I think there's something trying to get out of your wardrobe. And sure enough, a faint rattling could be heard from inside it. For the first time, Riddle looked frightened. Open the door, said Dumbledore. Riddle hesitated, then crossed the room and threw open the wardrobe door. On the topmost shelf, above a rail of threadbare clothes, a small cardboard box was shaking and rattling as though there were several frantic mice trapped inside it. Take it out, said Dumbledore. Riddle took down the quaking box. He looked unnerved. Is there anything in that box that you ought not to have? asked Dumbledore. Riddle threw Dumbledore a long, clear, calculating look. Yes? Suppose so, sir, he said finally, in an expressionless voice. Open it, said Dumbledore. 
Riddle took off the lint and tipped the contents onto his bed without looking at them. Harry, who had expected something much more exciting, saw a mess of small, everyday objects. A yo-yo, a silver thimble, and a tarnished mouth organ among them. Once free of the box, they stopped quivering and lay quite still upon the thin blankets. You will return them to their owners, with your apologies, said Dumbledore calmly, putting his wand back into his jacket. I shall know whether it has been done, and be warned. Thieving is not tolerated at Hogwarts. Riddle did not look remotely abashed. He was still staring coldly and appraisingly at Dumbledore. At last, he said in a colorless voice, Yes, sir. At Hogwarts, Dumbledore went on, we teach you not only to use magic, but to control it. You have, inadvertently, I'm sure, been using your powers in a way that is neither taught nor tolerated at our school. You are not the first, nor will you be the last, to allow your magic to run away with you. But you should know that Hogwarts can expel students. And the Ministry of Magic, yes, there is a ministry, will punish lawbreakers still more severely. All new wizards must accept that. In entering our world, they abide by our, by our laws. Yes, sir, said Riddle again. It was impossible to tell what he was thinking. His face remained quite blank as he put the little cachet of stolen objects back into the cardboard box. When he finished, his, he, he, he turned to Dumbledore and said baldly, I haven't got any money. That is easily remedied, said Dumbledore, drawing a leather money pouch from his pocket. There is a fund at Hogwarts for those who require assistance to buy books and robes. You might have to buy some of your spell books and so on second hand, but... Where do you buy spell books? No, no. Where do you buy spell books? Interrupted Riddle, who had taken the heavy money bag without thanking Dumbledore, and was now examining a fat gold da uh, galleon. In Diagon Alley, said uh, Dumbledore. I have your list of books and school equipments with me. I can help you find everything. You're coming with me? Asked Riddle, looking up. Certainly. If you... I don't need you, said Riddle. I'm used to doing things for myself. I go round London on my own, on my own, all the time. How do you get to this Diagon Alley, sir? He added, catching Dumbledore's eye. This guy's so cocky. So cocky. He was so cocky. Um, also, what's hit me is Dumbledore taking him into the univer uh, university, into Hogwarts, and teaching him how to use his magic? Kinda made him in who he, into who he was. Taught him how to do all these things. Oh, but then again... No, no. Like, maybe there would be a Slytherin, a bad Slytherin or something, who would take him in if it wasn't for uh, for Dumbledore. Maybe. Um, Harry thought Dumbledore would insist upon accompanying Riddle, but once again he was surprised. Dumbledore, Dumbledore handed Riddle the envelope containing his list of equipment, and after telling Riddle exactly how to get to the leaky cauldron from the orphanage, he said... You will be able to see it, although muggles around you, non-magical people, that is, will not. Ask for Tom the Barman. Easy enough to remember, as he shares your name. Oh, Tom Riddle, right. Riddle gave an irritable twitch as if trying to displace an irksome fly. You dislike the name Tom. There are a lot of Toms, muttered Riddle. Then as though he could not suppress the question, as though it burst from him in spite of himself, he asked, Was my father a wizard? It was called Tom Riddle, too. They told me. I'm afraid I don't know, said Dumbledore, his voice gentle. My mother can't have been magic, or she wouldn't have died, said Riddle, more to himself than Dumbledore. It must have been him. It must have been him. So, when I've got all my stuff, when do I come to this Hogwarts? All the details are on the second piece of parchment in your envelope, said Dumbledore. You will leave from King's Cross Station on the 1st of September... There's a train ticket in there, too. Riddle nodded. Dumbledore got to his feet and held out his hand again. Taking it, Riddle said, I can speak to snakes. Found out when I, I found out when we've been to the country on trips. They find me. They whisper to me. 
Not normal for a wizard. Harry could tell that he, that he had withheld mentioning, mention of the strangest power until that moment, determined to impress. It is unusual, said Dumbledore, after a moment's hesitation, but not unheard of. His tone was casual, but his eyes moved curiously over Riddle's face. They stood for a moment, man and boy, staring at each other. Then the handshake was broken. Dumbledore was at the door. Goodbye, Tom. I shall see you at Hogwarts. I think that will do, said the white-haired Dumbledore at Harry's side. And seconds later, they were soaring weightlessly through darkness once more before landing squarely in the present-day office. Sit down, said Dumbledore, landing beside Harry. Harry obeyed, his mind still full of what he had just seen. Uh, not, not only, but the first demonstration of magic Dumbledore did for Riddle was violence and destruction that magic can do. Hmm, that's true. Harry obeyed, his mind still full of, of what he had just seen. Um, he believed it much quicker than I did. I mean, when you told him he was a wizard, said Harry. I didn't believe Hagrid at first, when he told me. Yes, Riddle was perfectly ready to believe that he was, to use his word, special, said Dumbledore. Did you know, then, asked Harry. Did I know that I had just met the most dangerous dark wizard of all time, said Dumbledore. No. I had no idea that he was to grow up to be what he was. However, I was certainly intrigued by him. I returned to Hogwarts, intending to keep an eye upon him, something I should have done in any case, given that he was alone and friendless, but which already I felt I ought to do for others' sake as much as his. His powers, as you heard, were surprisingly well developed for such a young wizard, and most interestingly and ominously of all, he had already discovered that he had some measure of control over them, and begun to use them consciously. And as you saw, they were not the random experiments typical of a young wizard, of young wizards. He was already using magic against other people to frighten, to punish, to control. The little stories of the strangled rabbit and the young boy and girl he ruled, he lured into a cave, were most suggestive. I can make them hurt if I want to. And he was a parcel mouth, injected Harry. Yes, indeed. A rare ability, and one supposedly connected with the dark arts, although, as we know, there are parcel mouths among the great and the good too. In fact, his ability to speak to serp serpents did not make me nearly as uneasy as his obvious instincts for cruelty, secrecy, and domination. Ah. Time is making fools of us again, said Dumbledore, indicating the dark sky beyond the windows. But before we depart, I want to draw your attention to certain features of the scene we have just witnessed for they have a great bearing on the matters we shall be discussing in future meetings. Firstly, I hope you noticed, noticed Riddle's reaction when I mentioned that other, another shared his first name. Tom. Harry nodded. There he showed his contempt for anything that tied him to other people, anything that made him ordinary. Even then, he wished to be different, separate, notorious. He shed his name, as you know, within a few short years of that conversation and created the mask of Lord Voldemort, behind which he had been hidden for so long. I trust that you also noticed that Tom Riddle was already highly self-sufficient, secretive, and apparently friendless. He did not want help or companionship on his trip to Diagon Alley. He preferred to operate alone. The adult Voldemort was the same. You will hear many of his Death Eaters claiming that they're in his confidence, that they are alone or close to him, even understand him. They are 
deluded. Lord Voldemort has never had a friend, nor do I believe that he has ever wanted one. And lastly, I hope you're not too sleepy to pay attention to this, Harry. The young Tom Riddle liked to collect trophies. You saw, you saw the box of stolen art articles he had hidden in his room. These were taken from victims of his bullying behavior. Souvenirs, if you will, of particularly unpleasant bits of magic. Bear in mind this magpie-like tendency for this particularly will be important later. And now, it really is time for bed. Harry got to his feet. As he walked across the room, his... Ah, this is all good. So wait, he... One, he doesn't like being tied to other people in any way. He likes being different, separate, notorious. Um, he... he yeah, he... He doesn't like being tied to anybody. He prefers to operate al alone, and he collects thing things for himself. He's a collector. He's very like internal. Everything sucks into him. He says, "I suck everything about me." Harry got to his feet as he walked across the room. His eyes fell upon the little table on which Marvolo's gaunt Marvolo Gaunt's ring had rested all last time, but the ring was no longer there. Yes, Harry," said Dumbledore, for Harry had come to a halt. The ring's gone, said Harry, looking around. But I thought you might have the mouth organ or something. Dumbledore beamed at him, peering over the top of his half-moon spectacles. Very astute, Harry. But the mouth organ was only a, a mouth organ. And on that enigmatic mo note, enigmatic, mo enigmatic note, he waved to Harry, who understood himself to be dismissed. There we go. Next chapter is chapter 14. Felix Feli Fel Felicius? Felicus. Felicis. 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 Okay. Uh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Like that. That's a really cool scene. Dumbledore picking up young, Dumb uh, young Voldemort. Young Tom Riddle. I hope they show more of this. I like that they started with his... How he was. The Dumbledore picking up. I, w I hope they show him at, at uh, Hogwarts as well. Um, people are writing things. Uh, I think there was no, uh, what was there? I don't know what people are seeing here. I hear that Bellatrix deluded delusions, collecting trophies like serial killers. That is true. Yes. Yes. Like serial killers. So JK did both their names from the phrase, any old Tom, Dick, and Harry, right? Tom, Dick, and Harry. Oh, John Ellis. That's a good one. <laughs> wow a genius I mean if you want to call me that from now on, I won't say no be sure to pack your marker and glasses for your trip thank you very much Tash okay everybody just so you know tomorrow I tomorrow and Thursday I will not be reading I'm traveling to my parents and I don't want to be uh, tomorrow and then on the first day I don't want to interrupt family time to be to be reading so I will not be reading tomorrow and Thursday I will be reading on Friday again um, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be taking any of these lights with me or anything. It'll be pared down, baby. Pared down. Uh, if you're interested in being part of the community, and also I give the announcements when I'm reading where I'm not, go on our Discord, it's in the link. Also, if you're interested in supporting me, I, like, I want to do this long term. I really love doing this a lot. Um, you can go into my Patreon, support me with three or five dollars. I know there's plenty of other causes to, to do too, so if you feel more compelled to do that, feel free. But if you would like to support me, you can. Go on there. I will see you all on Friday. Um, I, I know uh, parts around the world have got a tighter quarantine. People say that, keep on saying that into um, into the comments. So if you are, you know, st stay strong. Hope uh, hope these are helping. You are loved. You have value. You have meaning. I know how hard it can be to to live on your own and not be able to see people, and you're just stuck with your own thoughts. So be kind to yourself. Uh, thank you for all the for all the, the the lovely wishes of a safe trip. Are your parents going to sit on in on the readings? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Much love. Bye bye.